David Baker, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong and the Swire Institute of Brain Science. And first, I'll apologize about for my singing voice, which isn't quite what it normally sounds like. Um, just having a little bit of allergies today. But I'm always enthusiastic to talk about corals and the coral triangle, and so hopefully you can hear the message that I'm delivering. And first, I want to say that this, this lecture is the culmination of a lot of effort over the last several weeks in collaboration with the Maritime Museum, the Agriculture, Fisheries, and Conservation Department, Conservation International, and the University of Hong Kong. So it's really a privilege to be rounding this out with Jude uh, here today at the Maritime Museum. So the topic of today's lecture, this very brief lecture, is the Coral Triangle, which is a very special place on our planet, just to the south of Hong Kong. And before we talk about the Coral Triangle, I want to share with you a definition. And the definition is to the word biodiversity. Biodiversity is something that we scientists say quite a lot. We don't realize that many people in the public that we're speaking to really understand what we're saying. But it is a simple term. Biodiversity is simply the number of species that we have. All species, all types of life. Plants, animals, bacteria, fungi. And if you go on the internet, you can pull off this definition. A variety of plant and animal life in the world or in a particular habitat, a high level of which is usually considered to be important and desirable. And that part of the definition is incredibly important. Biodiversity is important and it is desirable. If, for, if not for aesthetic value, biodiversity is intimately connected to global economy. So if everyone here in the room is concerned about money and economics, you should be concerned about biodiversity. And now I want to show you what biodiversity looks like. Because often we think of biodiversity as charismatic species. In Hong Kong, we often think about the Chinese white dolphin. And in China, we think about the giant panda. These are species that capture our imagination because they're big, they're fluffy, they're majestic. But I would like to advocate for the little guy. Because biodiversity the richness of biodiversity is really found in the small things. And the small things are what dominate our oceans. This is an image that was taken from a project called the One Square Foot Project, where they took one square foot, a cube, of a coral reef and pulled out all of the tiny organisms that they could find. And these organisms came out one square foot of our oceans. And what you'll notice here is that the bigger things, the fish, are far outnumbered and outweighed by the little things. And a lot of those little things are little tiny crabs. So just like our, on our landscapes and our terrestrial biosphere, we have lots of insects. Well, in the oceans, we have a lot of arthropods as well, the insect relatives. And scientists and governments collaborated for over 10 years to quantify the richness of biodiversity in our oceans through a project called the Census of Marine Life. With funding of about 650 million US dollars, nearly 3,000 scientists from 80 different countries conducted 540 ocean expeditions to quantify the biodiversity of the oceans. And this map of our planet is the result. And the false color image of this map indicates species richness, or the number of species, the biodiversity of the oceans. And what you can identify from this map is that there's one particular hot spot on our planet where most of the ocean biodiversity is concentrated. And that is this area here, from northern Australia all the way up through the coastline of Japan, and including much of the South China Sea. And if we look in finer detail, we can see what scientists discovered in this part of the world. Through the entirety of the census of marine life, there were more than 3,000 new species discovered, and there are likely to be more than 6,000 new species discovered when they're finished with their work. But to date, we know that there were 1,700 new fish species discovered, and, and this map is showing you where those species were found. 
there were 804 new species of corals discovered, 662 species of snails, 69 new lobsters, and in total, 3,235 as of the date of this publication, which is a bit outdated. But again, you can look at this, these maps and you can see that hotspot time and time again for every group of organisms that we look at is the center of ocean biodiversity. In total, we know we have described about 250,000 species in the oceans. And that's likely less than 30% of what exists in the oceans today. So we still have a lot of work to do. But the pattern that emerges is that there's a very special part of the ocean that is the heart of marine biodiversity. And this is what we call the coral triangle. And this image very clearly delineates the area encompassing the coral triangle, which spans from the Philippines in the north to Malaysia in the west, down through Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and parts of the South Pacific Islands. So it's described by marine zones that contain at least 500 species of reef-building corals. And these are organisms that are near and dear to my heart because they form the basis of my research efforts at the University of Hong Kong. <clears throat> but in addition to coral, scientists use many other species to identify this special place known as the Coral Triangle. Well, maps are pretty, but, but pictures of the Coral Triangle are even prettier, right? So this is a picture of a coral reef that you might encounter in the Coral Triangle, where 76% 70 of the world's coral species are found. And I want to take a second to talk about corals. Corals are these remarkable animals that you can see here on the seafloor. They're hard, which is why people are are confused by corals. They kind of look like plants, they feel like rocks, but actually they're animals. And these animals use energy from the sun to grow some of the most impressive biological structures on our planet, the Great Barrier Reef being one of them that is even visible from outer space. We call corals foundational species. It's because they're ecosystem engineers. They build the foundation of marine ecosystems. And since we live in Hong Kong, we can kind of imagine that we're a little in invertebrate crawling through a coral reef. The corals are our buildings. They build the cities that form the foundation of our uh, tropical oceans. And because of this, they attract a lot, of a lot of other species, animals that are looking for a home. So many coral reefs are centers of biological diversity. And as we can see, coral reefs are a hotspot for fish. 37% of the world's coral reef fish species and 56% of the coral reef fishes in the Indo-Pacific region can be found in the Coral Triangle. And globally, coral reefs are home to one-third of all commercially important fish species, many of which spend at least a part of their life cycle in or near a coral reef. So even tuna, for example, that spend their adult life crossing the ocean basins very high speeds. When, ju when, when tuna are juveniles, many species spend time on coral reef, eating and growing into the adult form. So these hot spots of, of biomass, all these animals, all these fish, attract megafauna. Megafauna like turtles, which are very charismatic. People love turtles. And six of the world's seven marine turtle species are found in the Coral Triangle. Only one is found outside of that area. So you can see that the Coral Triangle is quite a special place. Up to 30 species of whales and dolphins can be found in the Coral Triangle. Pygmy, pygmy blue whales, so the smaller subspecies of the world's largest animal that has ever lived, can be found in the Coral Triangle, swimming around in the seas of the Philippines in particular. So, this is a very special place. And it's special because all of these species form an ecosystem, a, an intricate network of trophic connections, a network of, of how energy and matter throw, flow through biological systems. So it's not just about the fish, and it's really not just about the corals. It's about everything in between 
and the relationships that they form. Some of those relationships are positive. We would call them mutualistic, such as the relationship between a coral and its symbiotic algae. And some of them would be considered antagonistic, like when a shark feeds on a fish, right? So we have predation, we have symbiosis, we have parasitism and disease, but all of these processes together work to create a functioning and diverse ecosystem. And one of the primary um, services that coral reef ecosystems provide is productivity. Coral reefs are oases in the desert where there is very little nutrition in the water. If you've ever seen a picture of a coral reef, the water is crystal clear. And that's why humans like to go to places where you find coral reefs, because we enjoy swimming in crystal clear waters. The reason that the water is clear though, unlike our water just out here in the harbor, is that it has no nutrients in it. There's nothing for any plant life to grow. So, corals, which can thrive in that kind of environment, uh, create these islands in the middle of the ocean where pri primary productivity can be accelerated. And for this reason, many, many people in the developing world, particularly impoverished nations in the tropical environment, rely on coral reefs as a primary source of nutrition. 120 million people, uh, of which two and, two and a quarter million are fishermen that gain most of their livelihoods from harvesting species from coral reefs. So coral reefs in the Coral Triangle, but also all over the world, sustain fisheries that are worth billions of US dollars. But the sustainability of these fisheries is really uh, questionable. And what we have to realize is that in addition to economic gain, cash value, many of these environments uh, there are communities of people that rely on reefs simply for the protein that they gain from the oceans, right? So we're talking about the livelihoods of people in their daily life. We're talking about the stability of countries <coughs> as a whole. So these types of issues are critically important, and at the heart of these issues are the sustainability of the Coral Triangle. Unfortunately, there are many good organizations out there like Conservation International that are working with local communities to find alternative livelihoods. And you can find a lot more information about these things on the displays in the back of the room. And additionally, we can gain economic value from the Coral Triangle by visiting them. So our tourist dollars can help sustain local economies. And if we only leave, only take pictures while we're there, we can enjoy the beauty of these environments without causing much harm. And in the midst of global climate change, we must all realize that in addition to being an important protein source and supporting tourism activities, reefs are protecting our coastlines from rising sea level and more dangerous tropical storms. In this image, you can see the typical seascape that we might encounter, where the coral reef is creating a natural seawall, and it's a natural seawall that is constantly repairing itself and building itself stronger and stronger. Reefs can absorb about 90% of wave energy that is attacking the coastline, constantly causing erosion and threatening the, the real estate value of our coastal environments. 84% of the average total wave height can be dissipated by having a coral reef in your backyard. So when we think about the future of our planet with extreme global events, global climate change, it's important that we preserve coral reefs to the best of our abilities. Now, you might be wondering why are we talking about the Coral Triangle when we're sitting here in Hong Kong? Well, we're just outside of the Coral Triangle, and we benefit from the Coral Triangle. Not only does it enrich our local biodiversity, but it has a key connection to our local economy. So what can you do to help the Coral Triangle? Well, within Hong Kong, we can work to protect our own biodiversity. And in our group, our, we've been working with AFCD to create a map of where coral species are located. And you might be surprised to learn that Hong Kong has almost 90 species of corals. That's quite a bit more than what you can find in the Caribbean Sea. And that high biodiversity is thanks in part to our proximity to the Coral Triangle. But you'll note from this image that the corals are doing very well the further they can 
beget from human beings. So in places like Port Shelter and in the upper part of Mears Bay, where we have lower population densities, we find more coral species. So we're working very hard to try to understand the factors that dictate where coral species can live and where they cannot, so that we can advise government on best practices for improving environmental conditions. At the same time, Hong Kong can promote restoration and recovery. So our group at Hong Kong U is working on coral restoration. What you're looking at here are small little finger-sized fragments of staghorn corals that we placed in a part of Hong Kong called Tolo Harbor. And in Tolo Harbor, has a bad history of water pollution. And we know from our historical studies that the corals used to live entirely throughout the harbor, but now they're quite rare. But thanks to government interventions and improvement in water quality, our little test showed that in a short period of time, about a year, we can grow corals again and restore them to their natural habitat. These corals grew 1,100% 13 months, which is really remarkable. And I'm happy to share that we're working with AFCD on uh, expanding this effort throughout Hong Kong. And last but not least, something that all of us can do is to consider that Hong Kong exerts an incredible footprint on the biodiversity of the Coral Triangle. This map shows all of the major routes through which live reef fish are traded. Okay, we're talking about the live reef fish trade. So if you walk through any wet market area, if you go to Sai Kong and look at the live seafood restaurants, you'll see a remarkable diversity of live reef fish. Those, some of them are, are coming from Hong Kong, from aquaculture facilities, but some of them are also being unsustainably harvested from the cor coral triangle. And I have a personal uh, observation when I went to an island uh, just outside the coral triangle in a place called Chuk where I spoke to a senator to the Federated States of Micronesia, and he told me a very sad story about all, how all of the grouper in, in Chuk were taken by Hong Kong businessmen, and he felt very swindled uh, by that interaction. So, because of economics, because of the great demand in Hong Kong for life, reef fish trade, uh, we are sucking away the biodiversity of the Coral Triangle. So, everyone in this room can think about this and think about how we can make sustainable choices. We don't have to stop eating fish, but there are better fish to eat than the ones that are unsustainably harvested from the coral triangle. And with that, I will pass the microphone to my colleague, Chu Wu from Conservation International, who's going to share with you some insights on the wonderful things they're doing to promote sustainability in the coral triangle. Thank you very much. hopefully a lot of the background for why we do the work we do in the Coral Triangle. But before I start, I would like to um, show you a short little film, uh, which... Uh, this film is actually from um, Conservation International's Nature is Speaking campaign. And the idea behind our films in this campaign is if nature could speak, what would he or she say? So this film is, if the coral reef could speak, what would it say? I am coral. Some people think I'm just a rock. Or in fact, I'm the largest thing alive on this planet. I'm so big I can be seen from space. But for how long? I grew for almost 250 million years. And humans came along and now one fifth of me is gone. Sure, I live at the bottom of the sea. And you might not see me that often. But you do need me. Do you realize that one quarter of all marine life depends on me? I am the nursery of the sea. Little fish depend on me for food and to hide from the big fish. And guess who eats the big fish? That's right, you do. 
I'm the protein factory for the world. Yet you raise the temperature of the ocean so I can't live here anymore. And when big storms and tsunamis barrel through the ocean, I'm your fortress. Yet you tear me apart with dynamite and poison me with cyanide. Well, here's a crazy thought. Stop killing me. Films from the Nature Speaking campaign? Yeah? Okay, great. You can see all of them online. Um, and um, they were actually developed for us by the same guy that does all of Apple's advertising. And so that was sort of the genius of his, um, represents his genius to say, you know, for so long, you know, humanity has just stopped paying to attention to what nature has to say and teach us. So um, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm with Conservation International's Hong Kong program here. And we are actually um, based all over the world. Um, so here's, these are actually the celebrities we have for these coral reef films. The Chinese version is by Donnie Yen, and you would just heard the inside of it. So um, quickly, just to let you understand why we do the work we do. Um, basically, Conservation International, what we focus on is to protect nature. And we protect it because people need nature to survive and to prosper. We need nature for food, we need nature for fresh water, jobs, health, our spiritual joy. And that's really simply what we do, we protect nature. And we're, we do this all over the world. Um, we're in about 30 countries around the world, but we actually make investments to in 80 countries to local organizations that will do nature conservation in those places about a thousand people worldwide. So, as I said, you know, our focus is on protecting nature, and one way to do that is literally to find ways to create what we call protected areas. So like in Hong Kong, the country parks, those are protected areas. In many countries in the world, for a long time, they didn't even have nature reserves or national parks, things like that. And so we would help these countries protect, you know, create these types of areas, and over the last uh, 30 years, the amount of land and sea that we've been able to protect around the world is about 75% of the size of the United States. So that's a lot of it. It's in all these places you see here where the dots are. And so today we want to focus on what does it take to protect the corals and the corals and the coral triangle. So, and, and we think of it this as in terms of protecting the health and the wealth of our seas. And one, the way we do that actually is what we call the seascapes approach. So we usually hear the term landscape, right? This whole big piece of the land. For us, when we work at the sea, we think about the sea as one big um, piece where a lot of people live there and make different decisions about how to use that sea, right? The government makes a decision around what policies they're going to they're going to make. Are they going to create? protected areas in the sea? Are they going to let the fishermen fish a certain amount? The fishermen there need to make decisions too, right? And companies there, the ships that drive, that go through the sea, they need to make decisions. The local communities who depend on that sea for their food and their jobs, they have to make decisions. And so our seascapes approach is actually a very comprehensive um, methodology that we've applied in about uh, 10 countries all over the world. Um, to help the communities there work with everyone that has a decision to make these wise decisions for the future of the health and the wealth of the seas that they depend on. And the truth is it's really hard work. It takes a lot of money and a lot of people working hard to come together and agree to do what's right for the future of that sea and the people that depend on it. But it's worth it. Um, and what I wanted to share with you today is one of the biggest success stories of our seascapes approach, which happens to be in the Coral Triangle. But what you see here is that actually all over the world, we've used this approach um, over the last 12 years um, and created a hundred of these types of marine protected areas. So what I'm going to show you today is about the bird's head seascape. 
And the reason it's called bird's head, you see right there? Actually, if you see in the map at the upper right hand here, can you see my cursor? There's sort of like the bird here, and the head is about right here. So this is called the Bird's Head Seascape. It's in Indonesia, and this total line, you see this area around here, is the actual seascape. And it's about the size of Great Britain, so it's quite large. And in that area, there's 2,500 islands and coral reefs. And sometimes when we talk about nature and the work we do, we sometimes forget to talk about the people, right? So keep in mind, it's, you know, when we talk about coral, we're talking about everything in that whole region, including around these coastlines, there are 775,000 people that live in that whole region and that depend on it and can either do good or bad things, right, for the health of that sea. Now, I, I prefer to show this instead of the map because this is what the birds had seen speak for. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. This is in a part of that region called Raja Ampat. Actually, almost looks a little bit like Hong Kong, right? With our little islands and the sea. But about 25, 30 years ago, um, the birds at Seascape was undergoing a lot of devastation. The fisheries, right, the amount of fish that the local people could catch was declining by as much as 90%. 95% of the corals were under threat. And what that means for the local people is that their food security was under threat. But after 12 years working there with 30 partners, Conservation International working with all these partners, the government, the local communities, we've been able to create 12 protected areas and therefore help secure the food and the jobs for these 775,000 people. So I want to help you uh, share with you some of the big picture ways how we did that. And that's a whale shark, in case you don't know. There are amazing creatures that live in this area. So I'm just going to highlight, you know, to me I think the most important parts of our approach is these five areas, is teaching people to measure, protect, value, empower, and sustain this effort to protect the seascape. I'll go through each of them pretty quickly. So first is to measure, right? If we don't know how much wealth is in that sea, we don't know what the corals are, the fish are, the people, then as they say, you know, they often say, we, we can't measure what, we can't, we don't value what we don't measure, we don't manage what we don't measure. And so the first thing to do is you have to measure it. This is the kind of thing that Professor Baker and his colleagues are doing in Hong Kong to make sure Hong Kong understands what do we have here in terms of the world. So in 2001, Conservation International and other partners did what we call a rapid assessment of the wealth inside the wealth of the marine treasures inside the birds and seascape. And the numbers are off the charts. They often call this the epicenter of global marine biodiversity. Because look at these numbers. 17, more than 1,700 species of reef fish, stuff that's on our plates in Hong Kong. 600 species of coral, that's 75%. In this little, little place the size of Great Britain, you can see 75% of the Earth's park coral species. 70 of the fish and coral species you can't even find anywhere on the planet, right? 17 species of whales and dolphins in such a small place. Huge percent of the world's mangrove areas. And the lar largest nesting beaches for Pacific leatherback turtles, which are the largest and fastest turtles in the world. And I really think we don't want to lose the fastest turtles in the world. <laughs> so, and again, don't forget about the people. Now, 40% of the people that live there live in poverty. 75% of them depend on fish for their protein. They can't just go to the supermarket and buy beef and pork and chicken, right? And 13% of those families there were hungry all the time because of this devastation that was happening. So then, once you've measured what's there, then first you can tell the world and the communities, this is so important, we have to protect it. And it's not just the numbers, it's where are they? Where are the most important corals? Which of the coral areas are where um, the, the mommy fishes are giving baby, you know, are, are laying eggs and, and they're the nurseries, right, for the fish that, that grow up and can be eaten. So these most critical habitats then get or were identified to be protected. 
And when we say protect, usually it's a combination of having the government make a decision and say, hey, here's an area where there's going to be um, regulations around fishing. Or it could be working with the community and they agree, they say, we agree that it's going to be a no-take zone for three years or during this breeding season. Right? So people have to agree to do these things for that, for that to be considered protection. And so we were able to protect, in the last 12 years, um, an area that's um, about 16% of this, this area, this overall bird's head seascape area. So compared to Hong Kong, only 3% of Hong Kong seas have some form of protection. And a lot of the local green groups here are trying to get the government and community to agree to take that up to 10%. Okay, but here it's been very stunning. Um, and so far, 30% of these most critical habitats are now under protection. And I'm very happy to say this um, gentleman here, Leonardo DiCaprio, he's actually recently given us funding to create two more marine protected areas in this birds and seascape. So another thing we do is value. Okay, what do I mean by that? Here's a, one good example. Well, you see these? You guys know what these are? Manta rays, okay, so manta rays, this is a very important area for manta rays. And for um, a variety of reasons, for including just beauty, the biodiversity, as well as for tourism, right, scuba diving, people love to swim in the mantas. But in the last, say, decade or so, there has been a movement within traditional Chinese medicine to take their gill rapers, which the mantas use to filter food, take them out, dry them, and sell them for traditional Chinese medicine. Most of it actually then gets um, shipped into Guangdong and then, and then sold, mostly in Hong Kong, China, and other parts of Southeast Asia. The, the numbers are now devastating, these, the, the, the demand is now devastating these populations. Now you can understand that the local fishermen, if there's 40% of the families live in poverty, and there's now this new income opportunity, you, you almost can't blame them for taking advantage of this economic opportunity. But what CI and our partners did was to make sure they really understand the full value of these mantas. And so we did an economic valuation, right? And it said, look, one manta killed and sold for its manta, its, its gill breakers, earns Indonesia, the fishermen, $500 US. But if you calculate over the lifetime of that manta, its value in terms of tourism, it's a million dollars, right? I think it's about 2,000 times more available to let that manta stay alive. So that's an example of making sure people understand the value so that they can then understand why it's important to protect the mantas, not just you know, because it's a nice thing for us to do. And when this, the result of this came out, the government of Indonesia almost immediately put in a nationwide ban to not allow manta fishing anymore. So it's very, very important to work. As I mentioned, another area that's really important for the work we do is empower. So I'll tell you the truth. In some of the more wealthy countries around the world where you can do nature conservation, you can oftentimes just get a lot of money from wealthy donors to go and buy a piece of land and then put a fence around. And that, that is considered conservation and protection, right? But when you do nature conservation, in these parts of the world where the local communities live there and depend on these places, not just to be healthy and protected, but to be able to access these areas for their, their foods and their jobs, you actually can't just get a bunch of rich people from foreign countries to come in and buy a piece of land or the sea. But you actually have to work with the communities to empower them. So this includes things like bringing them the science that helps them understand and measure you know, the health of their seas over time. It includes helping them set up these ecotourism businesses, finding other types of job opportunities. Um, it could be helping with um, gender equity, right? So um, in empowerment programs for the children and the women. A whole variety of things to empower the communities because they're actually the stewards and the many ultimate beneficiaries of this land. So there's a ton of a, of, and a diverse amount of programs that we do to do this. And so as a result, in these last 12 years, the successes have been quite stunning. In, in terms of destructive fishing, 
um, we've reduced that down to 1% of the fishers in one of these regions. In terms of illegal overfishing by poachers that would come outside of Indonesia, that's come down by over 90%. And the good stuff, the amount of fish biomass, right? The quantity of the fish has now been going up. It's about 114% higher than it was in 2009. And then also, the local fishermen are catching more every time they go out. And even more, 12% average increase in the coral cover, 30% annual growth in tourism. The local income from fisheries is now 33% compared to the you know, total income in that region. And don't forget all these mangroves, seagrasses, once they're continued to be kept healthy and protected, they're actually also absorbing carbon and helping us protect against climate change. Now the last step that I want to highlight is what we call sustain. So as you see from this graph, when we did the measure, the rapid assessment, that was in 2001. And over the last decade, we've helped them do the protect and the value. And it's a lot of work in between to create these coalitions of partners and communities to set up the seascape. And it's been incredible because now, as of last year, the whole program is so well organized that now Conservation International is able, and the partners, are able to spin off this whole program so that it sits within the Indonesian government at the provincial level. Right? So that's the best idea, right? Is to put ourselves out of a, out of a job. Because then the local people in the government can do, do the work themselves. So that's around 2016 to 2017. But the big question is, if we leave and we there's no more money invested, how are we going to make sure this whole region, the birds and seascape, is going to be protected forever? Okay, literally forever. Because sometimes we often think it's, we're just saying, hey, let's create a protected area or set it up. The hard part is making sure it stays financed forever. It takes money to keep these places going. And so we did a whole business plan and estimated that the annual local cost to take care of this whole seascape is about 6.7 million US. We've been able to set it up so that the governments, the funding from the government and from tourism generates a revenue of 5.3 million, but then that means there's a 1.4 million dollar US gap. So Conservation International with our partners then are now creating this trust fund. It's called the Blue Abadi Trust Fund. Abadi means forever in the hospital division. And much as like wealthy families will set up a trust fund for their children so that their future generations have money forever, we're setting up this trust fund for the birds and seascape. And we, we're trying to raise $38 million to go in this trust fund because that means even if we never touch that $38 million, if it generates an interest of 7.5% 7 7 per year, that's that $1.4 million. Okay, and this is what we call long-term sustainable financing. This is protecting nature forever. So, um, the work we do there is very complex, but I love telling the story because oftentimes, those of us that really love nature sometimes can feel a bit pessimistic, right? That the solutions aren't big enough, or people don't care, or we just can't do it. But the Birds at Seascape is one of our best examples of success. And the Seascapes model actually has been implemented all over the world now. Um, and we're actually taking this model and sharing it with all the country governments in the Coral Triangle. So they're now starting to do the same model over and over. Um, but at the end of the day, what um, I think we always try to remember is the people, the, the lives that we're impacting with this work. And so I wanted to let you guys know, I've brought our virtual, our first virtual reality film called The Lens Reef. And um, we can maybe show some of you guys later. And basically, this is a story of Ronald, this gentleman here, and his son, The Len. Ronald used to be a fisherman. He grew up, he, he, when he was growing up, the waters of the bird's head escape were very rich. But then he was there when the poachers from other countries came and started offering the local fishermen gifts so that they could come in and take away a lot of these fish. They were using dynamite, they were using cyanide, 
all this destruction. And for a while, the local fishermen were very happy that there was this new interest in income source. But then they started to see that their corals were being devastated, and they were starting to not be able to get enough fish to feed their own families. So Conservation International, um, when we arrived in the Birds at Seascape, Ronald actually became part of our team and went, he, he turned from a fisherman into a scientist and a community leader. And in this short film, Valen's Reef, it's his story that he is telling his son, Valen, that this is your reef now, Valen, and I don't want you to forget how easy it might be to lose this treasure. And I want you to see that what I, as your father, did so that you can continue to do this work for your own children. And that's really, I think, you know, some of the most important stories you have to tell. Um, so please, um, if you have some time afterwards, you're welcome to come to the other film. And um, I know I talked about the coral triangle, but we also have very rich corals and species here in Hong Kong. There might be other, there are a lot of lessons we can apply and share between our working coral triangle and Hong Kong. So I look forward to your questions and staying in touch um, if you'd like to be a part of the work we all do. Thank you. Process. And very simply, we're going into the into the ocean in Hong Kong, and we're digging down into the marine sediments, and we're looking for evidence of what was there. It might we sometimes find oysters, other types of bivalves, and often corals. In fact, we find the, the remains of corals all the way from the northeast waters to Lantau Island, all the way around Lantau Island. So Hong Kong used to be a place that was rich with coral reefs, and we just have no living memory of that. Right? So we're very conscious of the historical importance of the ecology that's out there. Now, whether or not the container port is a source of pollution, we're also looking into that as well. My group focuses particularly on sewage pollution, uh, which is obviously an important problem in Hong Kong. So we're doing some monitoring of those areas, and we're, we will be prepared to make any observations of any dramatic changes in water quality in consultation with the government. But the one thing that I'll have to say positively about China is that that whole region of Da Pang is national forest, national park. And it's the land-sea continuum that's incredibly important. And the fact that that landscape already has a high degree of protection by the Chinese government, it means that that Mears Bay or Da Pang Bay is already protected somewhat by Hong Kong and also by China. You only have to go one bay over to Daya Bay to see what happens when there isn't any protections. There aren't any corals in Daya Bay, right? So just by luck, the conditions for coral within Hong Kong waters and those waters that are shared by China in Da Pang, I have, I'm optimistic that they have a bright future. And recently, we've also been in touch with Chinese colleagues in Shenzhen who are undertaking grassroots efforts at coral restoration. It's funded by local people. It's supported by government. And, and we will be talking with them very soon about combining our efforts to try to restore some of the coral communities that were once found in years and day. So it's a very good question. It's something that we think about quite a lot. And I hope that we can be helpful in that regard. Cantonese and her family, I often point out the fish on display. And I always, the one way to pull at their heartstrings is to tell them that they're eating babies. Many of the grouper species that we're eating in Hong Kong, the steamed fish, are all juveniles. They're nowhere near the size they need to be to be of reproductive age. And this is not something unique to Hong Kong, this is something that's a global problem. We're eating juveniles because we've har over harvested the adults. And this is really the Achilles heel of fish biology. You need to protect the big adults, especially the females, and let them live their full lives in the ocean because they can produce a hell of a lot of juveniles to sustain fisheries for the future. Now, this requires a, a dramatic paradigm shift in how we harvest marine resources. I mean, if you think about Hunters are going out 
after trophy animals, the biggest, the most impressive animals we've removed from the landscape, and we're now removing them from the seascape. So instead, we should be protecting those large animals and be targeting the intermediates. The younger adults are probably more sustainably harvested than the large adults or the juveniles. So it requires a total paradigm shift all over the planet when we talk about fisheries as a whole. But in the meantime, we can talk to our friends and we can say, hey look, you know, that grouper, when it's an adult, should weigh, could weigh 100 kilos, and the one you're eating is less than a kilo. So it's a baby. You know, this type of conversation has an effect on people and it can change their behavior. That's a very good observation. Can you push the government to do something about it? Such as set up a limit or of size or weight? Sure. Uh, the question was, can we do? Can we talk to the government about uh, doing something about it, setting new regulations? The answer is yes. And I don't have any experience because I'm not a fisheries biologist. But I work with one of the world's most famous fisheries biologists, Yvonne Sadovi. And I know for a fact that not only does she talk with government regularly, but she has trained many of government uh, officials herself. And, and I'm quite positive that, that as the government composition changes in the future that we'll see many new positive steps being taken in Hong Kong. I was going to say, and, you know, as, as citizens, um, we can help the process of getting the government interested and activated on this issue. So I do know there are cases where citizens will call the AFCD because they've spotted something that should not be for sale in the fish market, right? Because the government can't be everywhere all the time. And then there are cases where the FCD will go and um, prosecute the seller and then take the rescued animal, say, to Ocean Park or Kadori. Um, and the more we do that and help out all as citizens to make those reports, and the government can see we care, we're the eyes and the ears on the ground, and that can make their job easier too. Yeah. I'm, I'm presuming that the, um, the impact of the fishing that we used to have, what is the fishing that, and particularly the nature of the fishing, which was dry and water, would destroy the lots of coral in easily accessible fishing areas. Yeah. Are you seeing that there is any kind of regrowth and return into those areas that would have be been heavily fished? of the actual coral in those. Sure. I know yeah. we're seeing an increase in the biodiversity in the sense of fish. We see a lot more fish around than yeah. we used to a few years ago. But I'm just wondering if the, the underlying ecosystem is starting to rebuild. Right. Now that's a very good question as well. Uh, it's important to, to understand that in Hong Kong, there are two different types of coral communities. And on that map that uh, my colleagues here have put together on the back of the room, you can see where those coral communities exist. So I can't see it from here, but some of those dots on that map illustrate where hard coral communities are. And these coral communities are found in very shallow water, typically less than three or four meters, and they're very close to the shoreline. So they're incredibly sensitive to what we're doing on the landscape, dumping sewage and, and fishing and things of that nature. But not as sensitive as we might think to trawling because trawlers don't want to go anywhere near those areas or they're going to lose their nets. And I've seen the nets and they do lose them. The other type of coral community which is far more sensitive to trawling are the, the soft coral communities that can be found in deeper water. These corals don't rely on sunlight for energy. They eat stuff that's in the water column. And in Hong Kong we have a lot of stuff in the water column. So it's a, really a vibrant place for soft coral. And there's a lot of brave divers out there that uh, do a, some impressive amateur photography or I would say professional photography of soft coral communities. But because of trawling, benthic trawling, that process that you've explained, dragging a net across the seafloor to capture everything that's living on the seafloor, those corals are completely and utterly destroyed. And we, we have not yet seen substantial recovery of these communities because they're, the species are very slow growing by nature of their biology. They grow very slowly. Uh, they re their reproduction is not very fast. They live at a pace that's a little bit less than many other marine organisms. But that does not mean that they won't recover. And they surely will. But what is uh, important, uh, the important observation that I can share with you today is that we have found places in Hong Kong which have are like time capsules of the past. There's a place called Victor's Rock, which is a seamount where trawlers 
historically avoided because they knew they would lose their nets if they went near it. And at the base of Victor's Rock, at about 30 meters or so, um, you can find incredibly rich octocoral communities uh, completely intact, untouched by any kind of destructive fishing. And, and then you can appreciate what these communities look like. They're beautiful, they're structurally complex, and they perform incredibly rich habitat for a variety of marine organisms. So, unfortunately, I can't answer your question with respect to recovery, but I'm, again, a hopeful optimist. <laughs> I guess this question is to Jude, um, and you guys have done such a great job in protecting nature, um, but I guess my question would be like, well, there are so many issues and needs, and there are so many things that need to be protected, you know, like pandas, um, the crawl reuse. Um, how do you, as an organization, prioritize your resources, like how you allocate resources? That's a really great question. Um, because oftentimes, as an environmental NGO, half the time um, people are asking you to do things which is not in your focal area. And, um, and I, I try to highlight often that um, it's really important that each NGO has their specialty areas and do really well on those and collaborate with others, other partners, um, so that we're all not just, um, you know, everyone trying to do this too much of the same thing. And, um, you know, not prioritizing our resources. So the way Conservation International does our, what we call geographic priority setting, is we look for the places in nature that we call biodiversity hotspots. So as you saw from um, David's map, the way we would define biodiversity hotspot is in that place, there's a lot of diversity of species, but there's also a lot, a lot of threat. Right, so if it's a really beautifully rich area, but there's no threat, that's not gonna be the first place we go, right? And so that's why most of the places we work actually end up being in developing countries, where they still have a lot of these really rich biodiversity areas, but they're under a lot of threat because either the rest of the world has nowhere else to go but there, so that's you know the Amazon forest, that's where China is getting its soy and beef from, so there's a lot of threat. And also because in those places, the communities, the governments don't have a lot of money or technical capacity to prevent those threats. Um, so that's how we focus. In, in the recent years, we've actually even more focused in to look at those places, not just from the perspective of there's a lot of species richness there, but we'll look at that forest where the species are and say, which part of that forest is the most important for people? in terms of that, let's say as an example, because that force is part of the water, right? It's supporting the fresh water for these big cities downstream, where that forest is so important for um, absorbing carbon for climate change. Same thing in the ocean. We look for the places where people, more, more people, more vulnerable communities depend on that place. So those are kind of the two ways we prioritize. Hello. Uh, see you. Is uh, is artificial reef uh, artificial reef uh, a solution for power uh, generation? Great question for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're doing? Uh, yeah, someone. Uh, are artificial reefs important for restoring coral communities? Maybe. There's a. Uh, the, the, the counter argument or the negative argument for the, for the use of artificial reefs is that they tend to attract fish. So we might call them a fish aggregation device. And when you don't have any enforcement of your fishery, that can, be, that can accelerate the decline of biodiversity in your backyard. So for example, if you put an artificial reef into a place, it attracts a lot of fish, it makes it easier for fishermen to catch them. But an artificial reef in conjunction with good enforcement, good design, a sustainable design, um, can be useful habitat for a variety of fish species. Now, your question was about coral. And artificial reefs for corals are something that have been implemented for probably more than 20 years. There are groups that are using uh, technology to create very interesting reefs of the future. For example, there's a, there's a company called BioRock 
which is using electrolysis of metal frameworks to accelerate the calcium carbonate deposition of corals and have some very impressive results. But the criticism to that endeavor is that you, it's on a very small scale. So perhaps you can invest in building an artificial reef outside of your resort to attract divers, but is that really having an uh, impact on the regional biodiversity? It's questionable. That said, we are moving ahead uh, with plans to install more artificial reefs in Hong Kong. Uh, currently, uh, I think for maybe 15 or 20 years, Hong Kong has used artificial reefs not only to discourage benthic trawling, but to attract fish and support fisheries. And I recently saw a presentation from an official from AFCD that I admit was very impressive. But those artificial reefs were placed in deeper water, and so they were not very useful for corals. Today, we're working with, talking with AFCD, and also working with the Hong Kong U Faculty of Architecture, which has a remarkable 3D printing laboratory mm -hmm. that can print, print structures on the scale of meters, eight meters in, in build volume. And what we've pitched to this, this group is that we want to print coral reefs or coral reef substrates, complex, hard structures that we can put on sandy bottom and then populate with corals. And I think that if we can do that, it would be a quite an interesting demonstration of not only blending technology with conservation science, but also creating new habitats for Hong Kong people to enjoy. So stand by would be my answer. Okay, so I think we should uh, wrap this up. Thank you everyone for the very interesting questions. Thanks to Hong Kong Maritime Museum, AFCD, Conservation International. It's been a wild ride. This is the end of, oh, let's say, six weeks of public outreach events. And it's been very cool. And you've been a great audience, so thank you very much. Thank you.